and they help us with reaching people. And that sounds fantastic too. Again, it's a networking within a networking. Yes. I think also sometimes as artists, what we discover once we get inside the community is how many communities are inside the community that we thought we knew. Exactly. And sometimes those are self-defined, or sometimes those are discoveries of our own that we didn't know this these communities existed all the time. Excellent. Excellent. Anything? Oh, let's talk about. Let's just have a few outcomes or, or results. What, what are some outcomes or hoped for or realized outcomes of some of this community-based work? Uh, to, for those that identify themselves as non-artists, uh, to lift that story. Excellent. OK, and to realize that the story is something yes. to be shared. Yes. Exactly. Yes? Um, Dorothy, I thought, just had such a really important part uh, or point, and it was based on what she did Bonderman, which was, uh, the outcome was to first ask the community what they need. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. Absolutely. Anything else? Uh, other outcomes? Any other outcomes in here? Okay, cool. What, what I'm going to ask for now is I'm going to ask Tom to talk a little bit about a really exciting project that he's done that really has caused, in many ways, a sea change in the way that his theater company looks at itself and considers itself with something called the SPARK program. And then we're going to ask Hallory to talk a little bit about a very exciting project that she's been working on in Louisville as far as it's concerned. So Tom, could you uh, share, with, share your sparks with us? Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm delighted to, to be here with you all today. Um, so Spark is actually a, a play that I wrote um, in collaboration with Community. And, um, and it, it feels important to start with the organization that I work for, which uh, in fact is a service organization. So Adventure Stage is a theater program uh, within the context of a larger social service agency that's been serving the West Town neighborhood in Chicago for 125 years. Uh, the, the theater itself, the physical structure has only been there uh, since 1999, 98. Uh, and uh, Adventure Stage has only been producing uh, plays since 2004. So um, we started off uh, producing, like, uh, as the founder, I could say, um, what I thought we, we should be producing. And um, and it was, you know, going out and finding plays and finding directors and finding actors and designers and bringing a team together and putting on what was considered to be good work. Uh, the, the funny thing was nobody who was coming in the other side of the building to get food from the food pantry or um, sending their kids to the Head Start program or um, sending their kids to the after school program. Uh, there are dozens of programs. They were not coming around the other side of the building and into the theater doors. And we really had to figure out why. Uh, the settlement has historically served immigrant populations. so. Maybe it was a language barrier. Maybe there was a cultural barrier there. We certainly prided ourselves on telling universal stories, hero journey stories that would be identifiable, we hoped, to everyone uh, on a spectrum of ages and a spectrum of cultural experiences. But it, it just wasn't happening, at least that particular um, uh, demographic, if you want. And um, that was important to recognize because that's the organization that allows the theater to exist. So if we're not serving the population that is the primary population that's served by the rest of the organization, are we really relevant? And, uh, and that was something we really wrestled with uh, and ultimately changed the way we make work. Uh, so we knew that, that we wanted to tell the story of our neighbors. Uh, we also knew that we didn't want to abandon being a TYA company. Uh, and so it became, it has become, a journey of synthesizing uh, those stories that we hear in the community with highly imaginative, often playwright-driven work on our stage. Uh, and Spark is the second play that we have developed in this way. Uh, and it, it received its premiere a year ago, uh, last spring. Um, so should I talk about the process? Yeah, or? Yeah, okay. So, Using community directly in the generative process, I think. Is yes, absolutely. 
Um, so uh, we started out really uh, knowing a couple of just basic things. Uh, one was that uh, in Chicago there was a lot of interest and movement. Is Hallie here? Uh, Hallie Gordon, who I think is, is going to be at the conference uh, tomorrow, started a, uh, an initiative that predates Spark by probably 20, 12, at least 12 months, maybe a little bit longer, called Now is the Time, which was intended to really look at how arts organizations can be instrumental in the transformative process of, of um, getting kids off the streets and, and um, there's been so much youth violence in Chicago that was, of course, publicized nationally. Um, we were not a part of that initial conversation, but decided that we wanted to be, so we, we thought Spark would be the, the project for that. It wasn't called Spark at the time, but um, as a playwright, I had an interest in um, the Promethe Prometheus myth, and, um, and I felt like there was some possibility there to, to, to to use the mythology as a springboard for exploring violence. The uh, mistake I made was starting with the theme of violence uh, and, and recognizing that bringing strangers into a room together to talk about violence is, is difficult because <laughs> well, uh, you're laughing so you probably get it. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, the director, Reeves Collins, um, made the, the brilliant suggestion that we start with the myth and ask them if it was still relevant to their lives. Uh, and, and, you know, could we talk about metaphor? Could we, could we understand what was happening in the story and how it still relate, it might relate to them personally? Uh, and lo and behold, we got to violence anyway. We didn't have to force the, the issue. So the, the initial stage of development was uh, generative in that we gathered uh, small groups, sometimes we were in classroom settings, sometimes we were on site and had uh, invited uh, community members, neighbors into conversation and it was all just content generation starting with the story and then asking follow-up questions. Um, each session would last about 90 minutes and um, in some cases we went back uh, uh, a second time uh, when once as the playwright I had some, some good, a good chunk of material to start wrapping my head around, um, the world of the play started to emerge and uh, we would go back into often the classroom settings and start through process drama, uh, introducing the world of the play and inviting young people to help us understand the rules of that world by making them characters in that world, um, often from the standpoint of the power structure in that world. Uh, so, um, so then after that, that sort of stage, uh, there was a, a, a more sort of me in, in, a, in a room scribbling away. Then I went back into a workshop process with actors and we um, sometimes if, if a character or a relationship needed some work, actors were invited into that collaborative process uh, through uh, circle drama exercises. And, um, and then ultimately we got to a rehearsal script and then a performance where, oh, I'm sorry, I should back up. There was a, a stage in the process where community was invited back to hear the, the play uh, in process uh, to, to give uh, more feedback, um, and, then, uh, and then on into rehearsals and production. Um, so that, that's kind of, and then, yeah, that's, that's the, the process. So basically what we're doing is, is having, again, the intention comes from a desire to involve a part of the community that had not necessarily been so involved. The actual breaking down of the stages of that generative process for you, and then constantly coming back at a kind of uh, infinite loop of feedback and input for yeah. you. But then it still resides with Thomas the playwright. So it's a little different from devised work, which we wouldn't call this devised um, work. There were devising elements, but I would not say that um, we, you know, when I think about devised work, I think about the, the actors and, and, the, and the playwright and, and the director all in a room, all making contributions right. uh, collectively, sometimes by consensus, sometimes not, but ultimately everyone knows what they own in the piece, and, and this, I, I wouldn't say, was like that. I, I also think I should say that um, as a community, 
specific piece is a community sourced piece. Uh, the, the, the story was a springboard for a larger world, so it was not a strict adaptation of, of the myth of Prometheus. It was a world informed by that, and so it didn't actually end up, um, two things, it, it didn't end up being a story about gun violence in the streets of Chicago. Uh, what, by, by way of the story circles, it became a story, uh, a metaphoric or allegorical story uh, about uh, the closing of schools in Chicago, which is, is, is its own kind of violent act um, in the community. Um, and so I would say, as the playwright, I really had to, to shift and let the piece sort of go where it wanted to, um, as opposed to sort of engineer it uh, in a way that would serve maybe my initial impulse. One of the things that Tom and I were talking, and Tyler were talking about at lunch is that I think from a theater standpoint, from a, a company standpoint, we sometimes start when we are looking at how we pick a season or how we decide which, what pieces we're going to do by saying, okay, well, what are our assumptions and parameters? You know, what are those that we want to have, you know, the parameters of time, the parameters of subject, the parameters of work, which is very different. than, to, and, and then you try to find the work that fits that frame. But I think you're talking about, with the creation of this piece, something that is saying, okay, what is the pulse of this interaction and conversation, and then how does that redefine the parameters of what you're actually looking at? Would you say that working in this way on both of these projects has really changed, perhaps, a way that your theater, in a larger sense, is going to be creating work? Ab no, absolutely. Um, in fact, we went, as I said initially, um, producing three shows a year on a particular budget size uh, to uh, now producing one original play uh, of a slightly larger scale. So we've, we've actually had to get comfortable reallocating resources and really focusing on developing a work uh, with, with some, some um, integrity, I guess, I don't, I don't know if that's the right word, but, um, and, and it has required a lot of shifting and ev you know, across the board from the way we administer to, um, to the way we then uh, produce it. Which I think is very exciting. It's where we say, okay, you know, it's not, not just saying, what are we looking for that fits our mold? We're saying, how do we change our mold so that it can contain our work? And I think that's a profound difference. Thanks, Tom. So going now, Tower, to the project that you did, you had a commission, and yeah. then you came up with a crazy idea. So um, about two and a half years ago, three years ago, uh, Stage One's producing artistic director, Peter Holloway, um, was looking at what Stage One had to offer um, and had just come off of a really positive experience actually working with Susan on Wiley and the Harry Man musical um, and really excited about new work. And he said, you know what? If there's one story that Stage One in Louisville can tell, it is the story of Cassius Clay as a young man. Uh, Muhammad Ali is known throughout the world, and he is, he is a loved, beloved son of Louisville. But there's not a lot of information about this young man growing up on the west side of the city, and he said, that's our audience. I want everyone to know that young man and identify with him. So um, we, we started on this project, and we started it going, and we commissioned Idris Goodwin, who was fabulous. And I just got the feeling that this project was something really special. There were just the stars aligned, and, and Stage one was putting all of our heart and our resources into a project, and you could just feel it in the room. And I had the impulse, talking about impulses, uh, I had the impulse to share that. And I had a couple of, of ulterior motives, and I'll, let me just make sure I'm remembering the ulterior motive. Uh, yeah, the, the first ulterior motive that I had was, was to connect, and to connect people to come into Louisville to see the piece, but also to connect people in Louisville with there's some people outside, you know, stage one in the last seven, eight years um, has had to kind of turn inward a bit to keep things going, to survive, and I've been really lucky and blessed, and they've given me a lot of space and time to go out and, and go to gatherings like this on my own, but there are many, many, many people on that staff that haven't had the chance to, to come and join me, and I thought, well, what if I bring the gathering to them? 
right? What if I what if I bring that to the stage one staff? So that was my first thought. Um, my second impulse was to connect TYA with uh, the adult theater that was happening in town because when I looked at the calendar, it just so happened that Cassius Clay was going up and two and a half blocks down the street at Actors Theater of Louisville, they were doing Naomi Azuka's At the Vanishing Point, which is a piece that was based off of interviews that she did with citizens of Louisville's Butchertown neighborhood. And I thought, well, that has to be kind of cool. We're both doing these Louisville pieces. And I wanted to break down this perceived barrier of those of us that are doing theater for grown-ups and theater for, for kids. I thought, you know, the students that come see shows at stage one grow up and go to Actors Theater. It's so clear. So I wanted to kind of break that down. And then the third thing I wanted to do, what was the third thing? Oh, the third thing I wanted to do, and it, this was actually Susan's idea, because I said to Susan, okay, I've, I have this impulse to share, I want people to come. And Susan said, Tallery, if you're asking people to come and participate, you have to invite them in as co-creators and co-collaborators. So instead of just saying, hey friends, I'm doing, I'm, you know, come see these shows, come participate in the weekend, I got on the phone, I called Tom, I called Courtney, I called people that were kind of in the region, and I asked them to contribute. I said, I have this half idea, I need to flesh it out, I don't know what this is, what do you think it should be? And Tom gave me some ideas talking about Spark, and Courtney gave me some ideas talking about Shaping Right Now, and what I ended up with was instead of like one panel, of, of speakers, I ended up with three or four questions, and in between questions, we like like rotated the panelists. So <laughs> we ended up having like uh, you know 11, 12, 13 people that were contributing to the content rather than kind of coming to take it in. So they were really kind of included in an integral part of creating the weekend, and it was really quick. You know, folks came down on a Friday night, they saw the show at Actors Theater, and how great is it to see each other's work, right? When did that happen? Saw, um, saw that, we had a quick conversation on Saturday morning as a community of about 40 people. I'd say 20 of those were, were folks uh, from the local community in Louisville. And then we saw, and in this corner, Cassius Clay that afternoon, and did a quick chat with the playwright and the cast about that process. Uh, and then we were kind of off. It was a, it was kind of quick and dirty and um, and great and really inclusive in that way. So we're talking about again going back to the festivus concept. We talk about a bringing together a convocation of in this case regional artists into the community as well with material that springs from that community. So I think and we begin to also look at that it is this continuum between generative through the vessel, if we will, of production into what had been considered outreach. And if we begin to look at this as a single continuum, instead of separate entities, we get a kind of nourishing flow, I think, that happens between all of those. And it changes profoundly our idea of the difference between, and this is something that's come up in last night and is increasingly in my mind, what is the difference between access and inclusion? And I had very recently, just a profound experience, which I'll share with you guys on that. Um, I had the experience of this fall going, or this spring going up to Boston where all three plays of my tr trilogy are, were being done. I only got to see one. But that was, uh, Mother Hicks was done by Emerson and uh, The Taste of Sunrise was done by Wheelock Family Theater with Wendy uh, Lament just being the brainchild behind all of this. And then uh, Central Square did um, the, the Edge of Peace. But something profound happened to me when I was watching uh, Wendy's production of The Taste of Sunrise. I've seen a lot of productions that had access to the deaf community, but there was something so hugely different about this. It, and it, it, it changed me profoundly. What I found out is that she had a deaf co-director, that, that a third of her, fully a third of the cast was deaf, and that she had deaf designers. Now, the inclusion of deaf designers meant a whole different way of seeing, particularly the lighting design. And I suddenly, it was like, all of a sudden, the, the difference between inclusion and creating the community that could fully realize this play was very different from access about inviting the deaf, we want the deaf community to come see this. And so, as Tallery and I started talking about, let's really challenge ourselves to look at what's the difference between and access, and how does that impact what we have with community? 
And Tyler, do you want to chat a little bit about that? And then we can open this up a little bit. We've got some sort of driving questions that we want to deal, but one of these is inclusion versus access. Well, I think, I think it's important to think about, first of all, the, we talked about kind of widening, cracking that term open, because it's easy to think about those two words relegated to kind of the disability community and thinking about it that way. And so I would say kind of yes and to yes. that. Um, I know for me, access is really important. If, if the people you are interested in having a dialogue with can't get in your doors, then you can't get any further than that. So you cannot replace inclusion with access. I think they work together, and I think they're, they're a stepping stone. You know, for me to have the impulse of, of having this, this mini festival, and for Susan to say, make sure that those people you're inviting are an integral part of creating it along every step of the way, make sure that that, that dialogue is inherent, was, was so helpful. Um, I just lost my thought. That's okay. It went out of my brain. Cool. But I mean, you're talking about not just organizing the old model of how you structure a panel or how you structure a conversation. You're really talking about help us found what those primary points are going to be. And it was interesting how many people were willing to wear those multiple hats. Right. It's easy to think about, well, Idris is going to come in and he's going to talk about writing and in this corner cash is play. Well, the whole reason that Stage One started working with Idris was because he had a show in the Humana Festival two and a half years uh, you know, before that. So, so bringing that into the conversation. Naomi Azuka has been working with the Children's Theater Company in Minneapolis for years. So she wasn't able to join the actual conversation. But in, in talking to her about what we were about, she had a lot of really fascinating things to say about creating story for young people and connecting into that. And I think that if I had thought about kind of um, it th thought about it in a one-dimensional way of, oh, well, these people will just kind of come and participate, it was much different than when I kind of cracked it open and said, well, what do you, what do you think, how do you think I should do that? You know, I got much richer and much deeper participation from everybody. Tom, in terms of the ways that you guys are dealing with this difference between, say, inclusion and access, um, uh, well, Yeah, I, I just was thinking, you know, um, in the spirit of, of yes and, I think there's there uh, for us initially was this um, sort of knee-jerk concern about the pendulum swing of the organization and suddenly we would only be serving what is in effect, in effect a very small audience, those people served by the settlement house, which um, is, is not very many people and certainly not enough to support an organization of our size. We're still a very small theater um, but uh, but certainly that was not uh, that is not a, a community of people who are in a place financially to uh, to support us. Uh, so we have to we have to think about access, get them in the door. But it, what it, what it has been um, how it has been transformational is that we're now rethinking uh, not only the, the pieces that we want to create. Uh, the, the new place that we want to create, but what are the opportunities for us to uh, to expand, to, to have a fuller presence in the community, um, and and to be partnering with uh, other theater companies that uh, in that are in Chicago that um, that could also we think um, say something unique to this community, uh, and also again it's it's about speaking to that community, but also connecting to some some larger. Themes that, that everyone has has uh, a, a window into. Um, so partnering with other uh, with other artists, both both uh, locally and also nationally and internationally. I think as an artistic director, it's helping me realize what the new frame for the kind of work that we want to be programming is, uh, and it has the potential to transform uh, what we look like as a staff, what, uh, you know, the languages we speak when we answer the phone. I mean, it has ramifications that uh, I think we as a company are willing to, uh, to, to move on. Um, we just have to really be thoughtful about the pace at which we can actually make that happen and realize that, that every step, as small as it may be, is a step in the right direction. Um, if we're not there next year and, and look completely transformed uh, in, in the eyes of our community, um, does that mean we failed? No, I don't think so. I think it, it means uh, we keep working at it. 
And you know, I think it's, it's not even so much of a factor of money, it's a factor of time, and it's also a factor of just uh, uh, troubling or challenging our assumptions about the ways that we, we have proceeded for within that. That's great. I think the whole notion also of how do we create these reflective spaces? And at what point do we create the reflective spaces? And, and again, trying to open that, that conversation up is interesting. Um, Tallery, in terms of what do you think some of the long-term benefits might be from the gathering in the world? I mean, so that it's more than a one-off. How do we continue? How do we keep those conversations going? What thoughts might you have on that? I, well, I think at, we really, by the, by in the short time that we were together, we really self-identified. We did identify ourselves as a group of regional artists that wanted to keep the conversation going. Um, one of the most poignant moments for me was at the very end of our gathering, we realized that as a group, we had been talking in the abstract about the communities that we were serving in a very us versus them dynamic. And we said, the next time we meet, it cannot just be the artists in the room that want to serve our communities. It must be an integrated, diverse conversation with, with people that are part of that community as well. And that was a really valuable place um, and a tricky place to stop because right. we kind of cracked that open and went, oh, no, it's time to leave. Yeah. But, but a, great, um, a great guiding light towards our next gathering together as a, a group of regional artists that wanted to stay connected. That sounds great. Yeah. How do you keep that conversation going within that? Um, Tom, just very quickly, in terms of, uh, do you have another Spark project or uh, uh, similarly? Uh, yeah, so, so um, the, we've committed to creating one piece like this each year, and um, we're realizing we have to get better and better about our planning of that process, because a year is not a lot of time to make a, a play, as you all know. Um, so we have a, our current show, which if anybody's coming to One Theater World uh, on this weekend, you will see, it's called Worthy. Uh, it was a piece that was created uh, in similar fashion, but in honoring the creators of that process, um, it was a devised process. And so, um, it, it, you know, the three pieces that we've created uh, in this way have each have a very, uh, I think, distinct, um, components, uh, tones, the, the, the flavor of each feels very unique. Um, next year, uh, I am uh, writing a, a prequel to, um, to Spark, which just uh, the, the world of that play, sort of uh, a lot of people were asking, you know, uh, where, where, how did we get here? And other people were asking, where did we go? So I think uh, in taking after Susan Zeter, I think we're looking at, <laughs> at an exciting trilogy opportunity. Um, but, um, I think the thing that, that I want to come back to is um, the way this process has, has opened up conversations around, uh, with playwrights, has allowed us to, to really um, look at the audience we are serving. So not only then are we um, part of this larger social service agency, we also have a commitment to uh, middle schoolers. So our target audience, our young audience, is uh, fourth to eighth grade. That's how we define uh, middle schoolers. And what it's meant is that the work, uh, we, we want it to, we really want to empower those young audiences to be thinking critically about the community they live in and, um, and get excited about the possibility of being more engaged civically. Uh, so the work tends to explore uh, I, I, don't, I don't know if we're an issue-oriented play, but we certainly want, because these young people are about to enter a, a new stage in their lives where they are uh, operating more independently in the community, uh, we want to encourage them to, to think critically about who they are in their community. Right. And, um, and so the work tends to have a social justice sort of component to it. And, um, and, and that has been really exciting to, to bring playwrights into that conversation um, because it, I think it really gives the work focus. Um, we're, we're, we're able to, to really, um, even though we don't always know where the, 
the content is going to take us, we always know the kind of impact we want it to have. So we've been talking about a number of different strategies here for involving community in the generative, in the production, and in the follow-up. We have a huge community right out here. What I'd like to do is open this up now for a bit of sharing. If you guys have a project that you are working with right now or have worked with recently that you think is another model on this basis of how we create something that is actually a dialogue of creative contributions with a particular community. Let's, let's get some more of these models in the air and talking about it, or if you have a specific question for any of us within this, let's get some of that. So, yes, James, share. Well, I just, um, I'm not gonna talk about a specific project, I mean, I could, but rather than talk about it in the abstract, I think that um, some really, things have been useful to me in terms of going out and, and listening to community. Right. Um, is One is not going in with an agenda, or expectation. Yep. And so in other words, I, I don't, it has been less uh, successful for me or useful to me to, to have an idea right. about the kind of play I wanted to write and then go out and try to find people who will reflect back to me what I already think I want to hear. Right. So rather, yep. um, to have a, a, a broader idea, whether it's a historical moment in in the community, something you want to hear reflections on, or just feelings about something. I find then that the play will reveal itself, that the stories are the story of the play. And I think that as long as you're willing to be surprised as, the, as a generative artist, whether you're a writer or a collective, uh, whatever, you know, whatever your role is, I think that's where the richest things can happen. It's also then where I think the community feels most heard. Um, and another thing I would just offer uh, early in, in my work with Cornerstone, a theater company in Los Angeles, as many people know, I, I think one of the most useful uh, piece of, of, of guidance I got was to remember you have to be both invited into the community and asked to leave. You know, you, you probably don't get to stay forever. You are a guest as that artist, unless you want to do the hard work of really becoming a member of that community. Right. But you are really a guest. Right. And it's so intimate that we think we are, you know, that we moved in. Yeah. But eventually, we don't belong necessarily. And so just knowing, getting in and getting out, um, yeah. and there, are, there are kinder ways of saying that, obviously. But I think that's, that helped me through some of my naivete. No, I think that's fantastic. And I think the other thing, James, is really pulling the importance of knowing not just, I mean, it's, it's a given that we have to listen. You know, it's a given. But how do we listen? And how do we listen creatively within that? And how does that listening then maybe shape entirely differently where we thought we would go? Yeah. So I think those are, those are terrific. OK, other, other thoughts? Yes, please. Well, sort of um, picking up where, where James left off about doing the hard work of yeah. really being part of that community. We're a, actually quite a large theater relative to the size of the community that we're in. And we're the only theater doing anything like this in the community. So we are doing that hard work of, of being in it. So Andy and I are um, working on a, on a new play now that incorporates a, a lot of the, a lot of the um, uh, systems that you were describing, uh, a series of s story circles um, with um, specifically targeted um, pockets of the community. So we have a program uh, called Building Bridges where we, we partner with community organizations whose work is reflected in the work that we're doing. So we may partner with the Flint Jewish Federation, with Genesee County Parks, with the Boys and Girls Club, well, we've been partnering with these folks for many years now. Well, now we're going back to them and asking them to organize story circles mm -hmm. that we will then go and, and, and interface with. Um, uh, it, the play is just now beginning. We just had our first story circles in the last um, couple weeks, and, and we are producing in, um, in a year. Andy, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, uh, well, in addition to like going back with the Building Bridges Partners, um, the conversation last night, thinking about wanting to think of how right now can embrace other ways of creating work that perhaps isn't necessarily like Shakespeare, 
I know that was something when Jeremy and I started talking about this project that I was kind of interested in exploring in my own work, but also being kind of like that's no, that's new to me, that's kind of scary. But then thinking about in addition to the in addition to the, the community partners, the building bridge partners, who are other arts organizations locally who I admire and appreciate and kind of a fanboy of and want to work with, like how can we bring them into this process? Right. So, so in terms of the kind of generative creating of this piece, having a, uh, a youth arts organization that does a lot of work, but their, their main focus is uh, their spoken word and kind of youth poetry, um, and, a, and a dance organization, uh, a tech organization that has a long history in the and, um, So kind of bringing them into the, the process of having these conversations, but also thinking about when we create this piece, in terms of like the languages that we're going to use to, to, um, to tell it, is really exciting and um, scary too, but like wanting to kind of bring that expertise into this process so that so we, can, we can make it. Mm -hmm. So working with this, this TAP organization, this spoken word organization, to fu fundamentally inviting them to the table to help us create a piece. And at this point, we don't know what that's going to look like. We're just uh, When does ownership or authorship fall into this? I'm just kind of curious, and, and particularly in terms of the continued life of what this piece is. Is that, for any of you guys that are involved in it, does that become a thorny issue? Is that a thorny issue in any way? with either the projects you guys or James, I know you've done so much of this. Ownership, authorship, future life. Um, well, for me, it's always about being transparent up front. I mean, I say to the people that I'm listening to, I'm a writer. Right. Uh, of course, anything you say may inspire something. Uh, right. I may use it, but I, I ask them to sign releases so that they know what it is they're involved with. Um, I've never, I've uh, done a piece where I felt like I was not the playwright. If I felt like I wasn't, then I think that would open up something where I would have to look at. Mm -hmm. But certainly I have plays that were, that were created this way that are published and that other places do that you know, don't have a relationship to the original community. Yeah, same. I think I'd, I'd do something similar to what James does in having people sign a release. But my uh, specifics in that release is that their story is their story and they're free to do whatever they want with it. What they are giving me is the non-exclusive right to do whatever I want with it in the context of what will become my play. Right. That's great, that's great. And again, creating, how do we create these as safe places, you know, where people really feel empowered to be able to give that depth of feedback or, or sharing, and yet also, knowing that it's good, it's life is a little different. How do you find overcoming, or have you guys found initial suspicion or initial pushback to that? And what are some strategies that help you work past that? Anybody? Yeah, same. Well, I'm a, a recent, uh, if you want to say convert or, or whatever, of story circles, and it's come up a couple times in the room, and I don't know if people are aware of what story circles is or that all of the the rules and guidelines are available for free online to anybody who wants to learn how to use them. And uh, it's been very valuable even going into prisons and working uh, with people who are not used to sharing their stories and, and being heard when they do share them. Uh, I've used those techniques and they have been extremely well received. Yes. This is kind of a, a simple thing, but whenever we're beginning a relationship with a new bridge partner, I always make points to to um, to, uh, to visit people in their offices, to have these sorts of story circles on their home turf, yeah. so that they are at their maximum comfort level. Well, that sounds like a very practical kind of thing to take. Yeah. One of the things that came up in our weekend in Louisville, um, Jeff Frank joined us from uh, First Stage Milwaukee, and he said that he was working on part of uh, the Wisconsin series, mm -hmm. and he had been working with a playwright to create a new play, working in relationship with the community in this way. Um, and he said that at some point during that loop of feedback, mm -hmm. um, there was a draft of the play that had been created, and it was shared with the community, and it was really clear to him um, and to the community that the draft of the play had gone in a different direction mm -hmm. than the community was kind of interested in going in. So he had to have a direct conversation with the playwright and say, I don't know if this is a good match. 
and he started over. Um, and he said, we're going to, you know, we're, we're still going with this theme, we're still connecting with this community, but I think there's a writer that's a better fit for this particular project. And I think personally, that's incredibly courageous. I do, <laughs> I do too. Yes, Jay. I just to say back to the issue, I think that um, you have, to, it's very useful to not be an expert yeah. when you're listening. Mm -hmm. I think that people respond, uh, I think it makes you more empathetic. And it makes you more curious. And again, it, it just goes back to me about not having an agenda. And I think that helps uh, build trust. But I think it's a process. And I, I would just go back to as artists, process is something we know how to do. And so can, bringing um, those participants into the process over and over again, going back to them, mm -hmm. bringing them in for readings or sharings, or sometimes what I will do is bring, invite all of those people in and do an actor uh, a performative event of verbatim transcript readings. Uh -huh. So they're hearing actors say their words, and it gets them a step closer to eventually saying a play, which may be which may depart very far from their words. Hmm. But they have the experience of I just watched somebody else pretend to be me. I right. think is how it feels, and I think that intermediary step can be very useful. Yes, David. I just, I just have had a little spark here in, in terms of thinking of the, the second iteration of some of these pieces that, right. are, that are generated in this way, and whether, uh, whether information about how they came to be mm -hmm. might uh, affect the second iteration of it and the, the preparation and the involvement of the community, whether that process could happen in each place if that process was I, was defined. Or and more transparent. Yeah, yeah. Than that yeah. Too. I know one of the things that's kind of exciting me right now as a writer is being able to take an idea or a script and break it down to its component parts and say, you know, I'm going, we're going to work on this little piece here. So you create like a little mini community. I mean, I, I'm, some of you guys know my play that was, I call it now the play formerly known as Aviatrix. <laughs> we had a title change since New Vision of New Voices. But what we were able to do there is to break it down. I've had an ongoing relationship with the Lucy School, which is a wonderful arts-based uh, pre-K through fifth grade. And I've been up like five times working with these kids on, on different aspects of it. And you know, first one is I just wanted to know how, how does a kid, how does a child look at principles of aerodynamics and what does it mean to them? Things like you know, lift, drag, thrust, those kinds of things. What are kid dreams of flying? What are kids, so really gathering that information for me much more generatively. And I think I've taken a, a lesson from the bottom of that and ongoing relationships with groups of kids where you get direct feedback, and I think that's been a fantastic part of it. But then we broke it down even farther and we said, you know, we've got some puppets and some things. Let's have the kids build them all first. And go and have that, and bring the designers from the theater out to look at what the kids are doing, mm -hmm. so that it begins to inspire them. We have a lot of flying effects. We knew we weren't going to get that at the Lucy School, so we formed a little partnership in Denver with a, a group, a, a former student <coughs> of mine who is a playwright and also an aerialist, and said, "Give it to your movement students to try to figure this out." And so we went up for three days, and it just blew our minds. So. You know, those of you who are playwrights and you're saying, well, if I don't get into New Visions New Voices, or I don't get into the Bonderman, or I don't get in, I need a place to go develop my, my work. Create your place. Find those places. Find the people that do have the answers or can help you, you know, generate that kind of little piece. So we look to building communities in maybe less likely places that don't take a lot of money, that don't take a lot of time, that don't take a lot of resources, but they give an enormous amount of resources. I think one of the things that's neat about that is that any point of entry that you have in this feedback loop continues to feed itself. That's right. Right? So I know that in Louisville, when people found out that Idris was looking at telling Cash's story, the, the excitement that that generated, the idea that he was willing to go sit down not as an expert and say, just tell me about your neighbor, tell me about what it was like growing up, tell me about your friend, 
that really got it going. And we, we were talking at lunch about, you know, access and inclusion, and at one point we broke it down. You know, sometimes I think our marketing departments think about access. So they say, we're, we're here to let you know this play is happening. Please come, please sit. Here are all the things you need to know about access. But really, when you think about community engagement, it can sometimes be that deeper level of, of inclusion. Not just our doors are open, but the invitation is explicit, it is personal, and we are interested in not just your butt in the seat, but in all kinds of different ways that you can contribute to this process and keep it going. I think one of the fun things about Spark is that that conversation didn't stop when that production happened. It's, in, it's feeding itself and is an ongoing conversation with the community as well. Great. Any questions? Questions, comments, concerns? Elements, areas where, where you feel you need more resource or in this kind of work? Anything? Yes. Who came to your play uh, in Chicago? Was the audience more of the people that were coming into the uh, social service organization? Um, as I said, that that subset is actually a small subset of our larger audience, um, but we did see an increase in participation uh, in that group. Um, and then uh, the other subsets would be schools. Um, in fact, we we most of our performances during a run are, are weekday morning matinees, and then um, for the number of weeks that we run, we we have weekend performances for families. So, um, so I would say on the whole, yes, it was a success uh, in that we did bring more communities into our space for that conversation. Great. Yes. You know, sorry, one thing that occurs to me too, though, there's a difference if, Tom, if you're a playwright in your theater. Right. And so continuing the conversation for right. you is different than many playwrights yes. here who don't have yeah. home. Yes. And that's what I meant more about uh, inter going into and leaving a community. It's I, harder when you're a freelance. Yes. I just want to acknowledge right. for all the freelancers yes. in here. That's right. I mean, that's, it's a bit of, it can feel like a liability yes. to do this kind of work yes. because you don't have right. uh, access uh, to ways to continue your relationship in the I, same way. That's absolutely So I just right. want to say that out loud because yeah. it is a difference. Thank you, because yeah. when you said that, I my the thought in my head was I, being a resident playwright <coughs> is a luxurious position, uh, and it does give me a very keen window on the audience that I serve and the audience I'm trying to bring into our space. I'm defining as a geographically located playwright who is interested in being a member of that community. So I, I do think that is a, an important distinction that, that not every opportunity presents. But uh, I think working in a social service setting has made me question what the role of artist in community is. And being, being in a place and being able to speak to the needs of a community that, I, that are my neighbors helps me identify functional, helps me function. <laughs> Right? I feel like I have a purpose um, as opposed to something that, that's just sort of tickling the back of my brain and so I get it out there and then wonder who the heck cares about it. Um, which I think is, is also very valuable. It's just, it's a, I think it's a different place to be. And I think well, your point is, is well taken, James, on this too. I mean, those of us that have an, either an established career or an established theater or an organization that we represent can go into that. It's the whole idea that we were looking at in those, you know, the versus versus. It's, there's a certain kind of privilege that this gives us that immediately comes with some velocity. And so, you know, that cannot be underestimated. But at the same point, I think once you begin to open up that conversation, and you find like-minded folks within that, and you are, as in the case of Flint, looking for those community partners that just said, boy, it never occurred to me that this could have a, an artistic or a theatrical outcome within this. That can be mind-blowing for those partners in the community, too. But I think then creating a structure so it has follow-through and it has a way of them became, being able to come back and see the impact of that becomes huge. There's also a thin line between what is exploitation 
of those resources. And that's where we get into a little slippery slope. Kara. I, I'm just sitting here thinking about getting it right. Yes. And uh, it goes back to intention. Yes. You know, why are we exploring a particular story? And is it, is it mine? Because I'm going to be the writer of that story, and I'm asking you to help me write some kind of a story. Or is the intention to uh, represent and to give something back to the community in order to strengthen that community bond? And at some point there, I think there is a responsibility to avoid absolute exploitation. And I, I, I mean, I, that sounds like I've, I've just set up a binary universe, and you know, if you're just writing your play, it's like, no, 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 no. But where I want to represent and honor others, right. I've got to ask them back again and again and again and say, have I got this right? Right. Yeah. And if not, if there's something that, that I've missed or it's, you know, it isn't sitting right, then what do we do with that? Yes. And how do we keep that conversation alive and open? Because if we come in as the artist and somebody makes that assumption, and, and I think that's, that's an absolutely critical point. So I wonder if Carol's just given us a, a way to think about some concrete action items. And yes. I, and I, I always like to start with what, when you're thinking about making, when you're thinking about making a change and when I'm thinking about making something more inclusive, I like to start with what I'm already, what already feels good, where I already feel like I've gotten something right. right. So I wonder, Susan, if we, I don't know, if we go back to our small groups? Let's just do it. We've only got about five or six minutes. But go back to your groups for a second. And just take it in, in has this conversation in any way sparked a new thought of something that could turn into an action item? And that might, that might come from something that you're already doing that feels right, that feels right. connected with the community, that feels great, where there's just another step in the future because we all know that, that these conversations are can, can feel one step forward, two steps back, two steps forward, one step back. So there might be something you're already doing that feels good that can propel you forward. Good. Just for five minutes. Huddle up and then we'll have just a moment to talk for a couple of ideas. Anything that you need to do something <laughs> actually. Well, um, yeah, 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 I'm not 
like serving our budget. Like, no, like, no, 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 It's not so geographically, the world of the play is not geographically specific to Chicago. It's a, it's a mythic world. Uh, it's actually an underground world. Um, and, uh, and, the, and, and so the, the characters are wrestling with issues that we heard about specifically through the story circle process. Some of the language that they use is specific to the story circle process. The world that they are contained in is is uh, larger than that. So, but but the piece we did before that, which is called Augusta and Noble, uh, the year prior, is very specifically about the intersection of Augusta Boulevard and Noble Street, where the settlement lives, and it is it is sort of more geographically shaped. The interesting thing is, how many plays do we see that are based in New York, and we're putting them on stages uh, in San Francisco and Tucson and wherever, right? I mean, it's, uh, I think it, it, it's about pushing, pushing to, so, to, to the, the bigger questions that communities are asking. Right. Jay. I do want to just, uh, related to that, I can say with Cornerstone's work, the dozens and dozens of plays, they never get produced elsewhere. Yeah. Oh, the play I wrote for them was one of the first plays that yeah. ever got a second production. Wow. Mm -hmm. And it is, I think people are scared of the specificity, and I want to second wholeheartedly yes. what you say, that we never question mm -hmm. that a, a play set in New York right. is universal. Right. And, and a play set anywhere else can only be done anywhere mm -hmm. else. But is that because of the rhetoric that comes out of those plays to say, this is all about the people who live here, or it's all about this community or all about this culture. And so we, you know, when you hear that, when you hear that as a producer, yeah. you're like, you know, well, I want to take that and sit it down in Phoenix. And will the people of Phoenix be, you know, are they going to dismiss this because this isn't their community and or their culture? Yeah. And so we have to be very careful about the rhetoric that we use right. when we start talking about these, about uh, you know, these uh, community devised and or created plays to say, it's about humanity. It is not about, you know, about Maricopa County, Arizona. And then it becomes incumbent upon the art to go deep enough and to go, to, to go deep enough and, and 
universal in its specificity, so it does speak. I, I want to say, too, I think we as a theater company, as a part of a social service agency, see ourselves playing a different role than a theater company that might want to produce something where the story takes place in New York. Um, that, you know, what is an audience, what's the relationship to the audience after that show? Are, is it about the intellectual capital that is built, or is there something that we want to see happen in our community that the theater company can be a part of that conversation? Um, I, I mean, I don't want to get ahead of myself. We aren't, we aren't quite there yet, but I do believe, you know, we see ourselves, uh, yes, we're storytellers, but we also see ourselves involved in a, in a larger civic engagement movement, you know, where young people who are sitting in our audience are on the verge of becoming active members in their community, and what role do we have to play in supporting them to be the fullest members of their community? Um, and I don't know, I, 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 I just wonder how often we're thinking in those terms. I mean, I think we're, we are, but I don't, is our audience thinking in those terms or are they just thinking about talking about the play on their way home and then, you know, doing the next thing? Well, recognize whenever we bring people together for a live performance, we are creating community. <coughs> Whether that community is a permanent community that's divine rich regionally or geographically or just temporally, we are a community. So I just encourage each one of you to go out and keep creating community and keep linking those communities to other communities to other communities. We're out of time, so let's go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're right at three o'clock, so what we will do is just take it like about a five, so everybody can get up at the restroom before our next meeting, grab a coffee and water. Thank you so much to our panels, our